Okay, thank you very much, Alexei, uh, for this very uh, nice introduction and for inviting me here to uh, give this um, uh, seminar here. It's a great pleasure also. We'll enjoy discussions uh, today and tomorrow. It will be quite intense, I guess. I would also like to uh, thank my collaborators um, on uh, the first uh, work that I will present. This is a um, collaboration with my uh, postdoc, Jamir Marino. And uh, so the second part of the work I'm going to present is joined with the Nottingham team, Matteo Makuzzi and Igor Lesanowski, and also my um, group member, uh, Michael Buchold. So um, Alexei already anticipated a little bit the uh, motivation for the research that I'm presenting. So it's about driven op open many body systems and uh, the motivation really comes from experimental platforms which are located on the interface of quantum optics and many body physics. A prime example from the context of ultra cold atoms is provided by the uh, driven open Dicke models pioneered at ETH Zurich where an entire Bose-Einstein condensate was placed into an optical cavity the interaction of a light and matter leads to the macroscopic occupation not only of a single but actually of two uh, momentum states uh, forming a um, collective spin degree of freedom which is coupled to the quantized uh, cavity light and in this way forms, uh, gives rise to a Dicke model which intrinsically is driven and open yeah, since, uh, so to say, um, the cavity is of course, uh, of, of course lossy introducing the, so destroying the closed uh, nature of, this, of the Dicke model, of the standard Dicke model. Another platform is uh, coupled microcavity arrays here. The basic degrees of freedom is light, which is then really confined to this microwave resonators. It can be made interact with uh, matter, with, for example, superconducting qubits placed in between these resonators here. And in this way, um, uh, at low frequencies, one gets an emergent interacting um, driven open quantum dynamics, yeah, where um, coherent element is, for example, the hopping of these photon degrees of freedom and the interaction they really come from, um, from, from, from the coupling to the meta degrees of freedom. Uh, yet another platform, which will be uh, towards the end of the talk, I will uh, involve this a little bit, is uh, Rydberg gases, strongly interacting and highly excited um, atoms, which uh, if one doesn't consider them in the very in the asymptotic short time regime, really undergo a strong uh, driven and dissipative dynamics. Yeah, one has um, uh, dephasing and, and, and spontaneous uh, emission, of course. Now, uh, yet the last platform here on the list is uh, exciton polariton systems. This is um, physics of semiconductor heterostructures. Let me postpone this for a little more detailed introduction um, later on and just point out here the rule of thumb whenever we would encounter this kind of um, driven open many body systems. So it always happens when light is strongly coupled to matter and essentially the volatility of light as a degree of freedom um, necess necessitates yeah, that one really pumps these systems hard even to initialize a non-trivial uh, many body state with a finite uh, density of excitations. And uh, in this uh, frame, we have here further examples like uh, experiments with polar molecules where, for example, in this paper there was a beautiful manifestation of the quantum Zeno effect uh, seen in the uh, group of, um, uh, of Junier. Then uh, close to the place where I'm located now in Germany, in Bonn, uh, people created uh, BECs of light um, in the group of Martin Weitz and uh, a platform which is uh, very prominently represented here, of course, is trapped ions, yeah, where, for example, in this paper, uh, people go to really large systems you know, of a, a few hundred uh, trapped ions. Okay, now let's look at this from a theoretical perspective. Yeah, this makes up an uh, interdisciplinary research area which you, where the interdisciplinary character can be read off just from looking at the system at various length scales. Yeah? So at the very microscopic scale, yeah, these systems are really essentially indistinguishable from quantum optics and they share this characteristic feature of having coherent and driven dissipative dynamics on a completely equal footing. Yeah, you couldn't neglect one or the other without somehow destroying the basic physics of the systems. On the other hand, and that makes it very different from quantum optics, is that these systems really uh, uh, have this spatial continuum of degrees of freedom yeah, that makes this much closer, brings this much closer to the realm of many body physics. And this unique and really rather new, uh, rather recent combination makes it possible for us 
to ask questions even at the largest, asymptotically largest distances in these systems uh, connecting us to the realm of um, statistical mechanics. Now here are the, the questions and challenges that, that pop up in these systems. To me, of course, most interesting would be or is to, um, to identify really macroscopic phenomena which witness these microscopic driven conditions in a really unambiguous and, and observable way. Now, in order to, to, um, to accomplish such a task, in the absence of uh, concepts that are, one is familiar with from um, um, condensed matter physics, yeah, like free energy, energy minimization, concepts of this type don't exist, so, so obviously out of equilibrium. And the goal is therefore to, is to establish the proper tools to perform this, this transition from the microscopic to the macroscopic scale in a practical way. And that brings us actually to develop quantum field theoretical techniques for this out of equilibrium systems. Sorry? So this is, so to say, moving from small to large distances yeah. to so perform. Further, I mean, should be further, yeah. further, further this way? Yeah. Well, we normally think of the thermodynamic limit as being, you know, Three as large as you can get. Oh, no, no, I mean it rather in the sense of a coarse graining. Yeah? You, you, you turn down the resolution, yeah? and in this way you incorporate the fluctuations of smaller distances. That's what I mean. Yeah, of course, and then, so for, for, or if you have a correlation function, yeah, it may have different regimes how it behaves. On short distances, say, algebraic, on long distances, um, exponential, or you want to find a structure in this way, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah? To, this coarse graining, so they're looking at, at a correlation function as a function of distance, for example. Yeah? And, I'm just saying that your thermodynamic yeah. doesn't seem to go all the way, but I think oh, it's Oh, thermo, ah, sorry, sorry. It's just an error no. that that <laughs> No, with, uh, this is, Thermodynamic scales, yeah, that, that is for me, sorry, thermodynamic scales, that's for example something like a mean interparticle spacing. I, I know. That's something that, is, that you don't have to care about in a, in a, in, in, in a scattering of three particles. Yeah. yeah? Okay, so, or, yeah. So you don't mean mm -hmm. it's an equilibrium, naturally? Yeah, no, no. I will make it now, in the, in the course of this talk, very much thermodynamic land scales, yeah, many body length scales, mean interparticle spacing. Yeah, mean, uh, uh, mean velocity and yeah, like temperature, stuff like that. Yeah, just yeah. scales. You yeah. can see why you put that word there. Would mislead people into thinking. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I, maybe I had the intuition to put these <laughs> quotation marks, but <laughs> it was not enough to. <laughs> I should replace it. Yeah, so thanks. <laughs> okay, but um, just um, of course we want to so to say see then in the end these things that works and we. We want to connect these results to, to experimental platforms, <laughs> some of which are already pointed out. So the, 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 the yeah. Field you're referring to Keldish, or you're saying that Keldish doesn't work? Oh, that, that will work, and that will. Okay, that's I mean, <laughs> that will. Maybe. Keldish exists. Of course, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, let me um, give you here some, so to say, perspective on. Uh, work that is, is done in my group in this in res, uh, respect, yeah, uh, looking at, at different uh, phenomena. So one question is essentially to, to take this limit to, to the extreme and ask questions about the, the asymptotic distances in this system, studying the questions of, of critical behavior in such out of equilibrium systems. So first of all, one needs to shape or to, to investigate whether there's meaningful notions of universality out of equilibrium and one of course would like to identify differences or parallels to the traditional sort of the equilibrium statistical mechanics critical behavior. And we can also ask whether there's analogs of classical or quantum critical behavior in these systems. Now a second uh, research line concerns more the phase diagram actually, so also non-universal effects in driven open quantum systems. Recently we were working on, um, so to say, an analog of the costalitz taule scenario in two-dimensional systems motivated by an insight that we had here that, so to say, in a two-dimensional systems, unlike equilibrium, where one has at low temperature algebraic decay of correlation functions, one necessarily has a cutoff, so, so a sub-exponential decay of, of, the, uh, of the correlation functions in the, in the low temp analog of the low temperature phase of such systems, and one wants to understand now the real parallels to this costalitz taule scenario. Now, um, we also, so these two uh, topics here, they concern essentially the, um, the non-equilibrium stationary states of such systems, but it's also interesting to look at interacting open system dynamics. Here one would like to identify, so to say, to structure 
the time evolution of such open systems into ideally universal or really representative regimes of dynamics. And uh, we could hear recently looking at the, the time evolution of, 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 of the heating dynamics in optical lattices in the asymptotic short time regime, we could found, find some interesting, um, uh, uh, so to say, uh, non-equilibrium scaling behavior. Now, another concept uh, that uh, I was following over the last years is again motivated by uh, by uh, practical questions from ultra-cold atoms, uh, cooling of fermions, for example. And um, we, we were thinking about efficient protocols to guide a given density matrix, uh, which uh, an arbitrary de initial density matrix, guide this in a targeted way into a pure quantum state with uh, desired properties. And recently, uh, we developed this uh, for, into a concept for uh, cooling topological states of matter which in the future we would like to look also from a quantum information perspective. Today, I would like to focus on these uh, two topics here. And in particular, I will speak about this, um, um, an analog of quantum critical behavior, uh, which may have a realization in microcavity arrays. And I will focus on a new absorbing state phase transition. If you can't, if you don't resonate with this term, no worries, I'll explain what that is. And um, here we will also it get an, so an, a, a specific effect of the quantum dynamics that is going on in this driven open quantum systems. And the guiding questions that I would like to, to keep in mind during the talk is these uh, slightly fluffily or uh, not, not very precisely formulated uh, questions, how much non-equilibrium of these driven systems remains at the large distances in the system? And the second question, how much quantum remains at these large distances. And I want to make all this much more precise than it's put here. Let's start with um, uh, introduction to, so to say, how do we actually see non-equilibrium conditions in the system and what sets them apart, really, from an equilibrium system? Let me start with a physics example, this exciton polariton systems. We have this two-dimensional quantum well it is, so to say, embedded into a semiconductor heterostructure. These here act as effective uh, cavity, as an effective cavity. And the degrees of freedom are these exciton, particle hole excitations, which are completely immobile and have a flat energy disp uh, dispersion here. And that is coupled to light degree of freedom, which due to the confinement in the 2D plane has this quadratic dispersion here. Now, um, one can couple these photon and exciton degrees of freedom, then they will hybrid hybridize give rise to this upper and lower polariton degree of freedom. And to initialize this many body system here, one pumps one way is pumping this upper polariton branch and you see relaxation. And so effectively you incoherently feed the long lived degrees of freedom in this system, which are these long uh, lower polaritons here. Of course, due to the admixture of light, these polaritons, they can decay, they decay as single particles, they decay in pairs. And that is all captured by this so-called uh, stochastic driven dissipative Gross-Bedaevsky equation. You look at the time, evolu uh, time evolution of the polar lower polariton amplitude, that's here this Bose field here, and you see here the, uh, the uh, coherent propagation of this. You have elastic collisions, but on equal footing you also have these imaginary parts. You have pumping, single particle pumping, yeah, that's this feeding from above, the losses, and the two body losses. Now, in these systems, Bose condensation has been observed in this famous experiment here, despite these non-equilibrium conditions. And to see how these uh, pictures here come out, yeah, we start from our uh, favorite uh, gross pedaevsky equation here, strip off all the complexity, so we look at a time-independent, homogeneous, and noiseless situation, then it's just a simple algebraic equation left, and simple intuitive picture, of course, whenever the pumping exceeds the loss system undergoes an instability and you'll see this condensation here that's actually in this approximation the same as the laser threshold. Huh? So naively, formally, this is, yeah, question? So this non-equilibrium case, uh, mm -hmm. what does it mean by the temperature? Is that temperature? Temperature, yeah. Well, I mean, that's actually the temperature of, of these reservoirs they're working with. Yeah. But the scale is really this five Kelvin, which is much, uh, much higher than also, they often speak of effective temperatures. You can, you can write down a fluctuation-dissipation relation 
uh, which is not, not precise, but it gives an order of magnitude. We, we can also speak of the Markovian noise level, if you want. Yeah? So um, we un want to now understand yeah, what makes this dynamics here. How do I look at this dynamics and detect really the non-equilibrium conditions? And to this end, I um, want to describe, uh, to in introduce a little uh, formalism. So we can think of these systems microscopically. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And, and then you say that naively you're just getting not getting, you know, both commutation and then equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Like, like, are, so it sounds a bit confused by that because then, like, since you've thrown away the time dependence completely, like, mm -hmm. the time no, no, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at, so to say, I, I look, at, look at it as finding a stationary solution. Yeah. And of course, we, there, there, there's a possibility to choo choose a rotating frame. Yeah, with which this, this condensate is rotating, but it's not as a local observable in this rotating okay, so frame. Yeah? So there can still be some oscillations going on, sure, yeah, but you can find, so to say, stationary observables when you, when you set this to zero. Yeah? So you would just want to look at the stationary state of this problem. That doesn't mean that there are residual phase rotations going on. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is, is this just the equivalent of doing time independent GP in the um, Thomas Hermine? Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, no, in, in, Plus in, in with hmm? all these extra pumping at once. Right? Yeah, but exactly. I, I want to, so to say, I, I can come back to this question later where you'll see how the gross pedayevsky equation is exactly embedded in the, in the picture you were saying. I, 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 I pointed it. Yeah. yeah. Now, mm -hmm. when all this stuff about exciton flaratons came mm -hmm. out, one of the criticisms that was leveled mm -hmm. against it was this isn't really Bose condensation. Mm -hmm. This is just uh, coherence that is uh, being mm -hmm. produced by the, by the pump laser. And mm -hmm. when you said this, you said, well, it was just a laser. Does this analysis that you're, mm -hmm. you're telling us about here mm -hmm. give us any insight into yeah. that? Um, yeah, you'll see, you'll see, for example, I mean, that one of the insights will be that, I mean, there is an observable difference, for example, in the critical behavior between a Bose gas in equilibrium and a Bose gas out of equilibrium, which undergoes this condensation transition. So, and, and this is really, it's a universal difference that just depends on the fact that these systems don't have energy conservation, while your, your systems, are, <laughs> they have it. Yeah? So, so there is really observable consequences of that in the, in the structure of the critical behavior. That, that, but maybe let me not anticipate it, because exactly I want to work at for this. Yeah? <laughs> for this. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Incoherent pumping. Yeah, no. Oh, there, there's no explicit uh, symmetry breaking. So there's no explicit fixing of the phase. That's true. There is still room for a spontaneous breaking of this phase rotation symmetry, both in this. Uh, so, so that's obviously not the real difference. The difference that, that we found is, is somewhere else, the observable one. Yeah? OK, so let me uh, go through this master equation here. So we look at the time evolution of the system density matrix, yeah, the system which is generated by some coherent evolution, plus this, uh, this dissipative uh, contribution to dynamics, yeah, which comes about by integrating out bath degrees of freedom in a second order time dependent perturbation theory. So this is called this whole thing, oftentimes a Liouville operator, and these system bath coupling operators are termed Lindblad operators. Now this Lindblad form is the most general physically sensitive time local evolution of a density matrix that you may imagine, the validity of this in physics is, um, so to say, determined by Born-Markov on rotating wave approximation, which brings me to the system being driven. And let me uh, point this out at hand of an of a explicit, simple example. Two-level system with this uh, level separation here, we drive it with a laser with frequency nu and a Rabi frequency omega. A very simple fact is obviously that drive is essential to even access this upper level. So this is certainly a system that is dri driven intrinsically, else it doesn't even make sense. But the implications are immediate. Yeah? When you drive this, yeah, you don't have a microscopic formulation in terms of a time-independent Hamiltonian. So in some sense, the concept of energy conservation is lost, and you have no guarantee for detailed balance to be present. 
you also have in such kind of dynamics no obedience of the second law of thermodynamics, and that is a reason why you can, for example, purify states using this concept. Now, um, let's move from this two-level system to a many-body microscopic model. Yeah? So we take the same many master equation, now with many body, so we have here uh, a many body Hamiltonian, kinetic energy, elastic collisions, and we add to this the simple most, uh, also natural processes that you can imagine, single particle pumping, single particle losses, and two particle losses. Now, this system relates to this exciton polariton systems that I was describing previously, uh, in terms of taking the semi-classical limit of this uh, equation, this can be done really uh, in a rather strict sense, and in this semi-classical limit, this exciton polariton cross petersky equation pops out again. Now, it may also be viewed as a long wavelength limit of this uh, micro-cavity arrays, yeah, realizing driven open, open both Hubbard models, at least if one has an incoherent pump for them. The problem with this equation is somehow that the methods to deal with this uh, are, uh, not yet, are really scarce, are yet to be fully developed, although there exists, of course, the concept of a Keldish path integral, but it really has to apply it in practice to these systems. Now, that's exactly our approach. I won't spend more on that. We just take this many-body master equation, we find a translation table mapping this into a fully equivalent Keldish functional integral, and in this simple step, we open up the entire toolbox of quantum field theory to analyze these driven open quantum systems. And that may refer to the use of symmetries, which is very powerful in quantum field theory. I'll show you how to use this here. We can practically control this characteristic long wavelength fluctuations that invalidate perturbation theory in many body problems. Yeah, the smallness of the coupling constant is not indicative of the smallness of the actual perturbation. To track this, we need the renormalization group. We can flexibly choose degrees of freedom, and that's very versatile. It can be applied to bosons, fermions. Recently, uh, Alexei and Mohamed Makrebi worked on it um, in the context of spin systems. Exactly. Yeah. With, uh, yeah. Systems with almost no strongly correlated, right? That's, ex that's exactly that's true. To be amplified, I yeah, I, 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 I put on one of my slides, it's, it's this rotating wave and born Markov approximation. Yeah. They have to be, I, I can't comment on that. I mean, actually for these quantum optical systems that we have in mind here, mm -hmm. I would claim that this is typically a good approximation. It's and good. it is good because you have this huge scale yeah, in the two level system, you yeah, have the separation of the two levels. Yeah, it's in completely non-generic in condensed matter. Right. That's true. But when yeah. you claim that this can be applied to many body systems, yeah. you're already excluding systems with strongly correlated systems. Strongly correlated? Well, I mean strongly correlated to because the bath. There's, no, yeah. because there's memory in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I mean, I mean, this is the most general time local evolution. Yeah, that, that, that's so exactly, yeah. For quantum optics, yeah. in many body, as well, in equilibrium systems, it's, it's, it's not generic, indeed. Yeah? But I wouldn't say that it excludes strong correlations of the Hamiltonian. It just excludes strong correlations between bath and system. That's the point. Yeah? Uh, we talk more, because even uh -huh. with simple bath, you can uh -huh. have normal coefficients. That's true. I, I mean, I'll point at the, the caldera Leggett model. <laughs> Actually, it's here. <laughs> so, I mean... Let, let me now come back to this question, what is non-equilibrium about, even in stationary state, not thinking even about the dynamics of this system. So two things are pretty clear from this uh, equation that I was writing down. We don't have number conservation, yeah, we have the single particle pump and loss, but that is still compatible with equilibrium. Yeah? We just think of these so-called caldera Leggett models, yeah, where one can exchange particle number, however the entire system is in global thermal equilibrium, so that's not yet. Uh, non-equilibrium. What is equi non-equilibrium is the absence of energy conservation. And that really comes back to this driven system which makes it incompatible with the conditions of thermal equilibrium. Now, here is one way of, of, of formalizing that. On the next slide, I will translate this into pictures. So, But your equation was time translational invariant, your, yeah. your evolution equation. Yes. So, so it's, so, I mean, ultimately time translation is what gives rise to energy at conservation. Not, I mean, not necessarily. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like where, I guess. You have, a, you, have a, you have a 
drive. But that's something you're microscopic. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but it morphs over. It's exactly this slide. Yeah? So equilibrium dynamics is generated by a time-independent Hamiltonian. Now, if we take this seriously, we look at any time-independent Hamiltonian and we find, interestingly, there is a specific symmetry of the action that is associated to this time-independent generator of dynamics. It's put down here. We don't need the details for the expert. It is going into a compact formulation of the so-called KMS boundary condition. But the, the power of this symmetry transformation that when it is present on your microscopic action, it implies equilibrium conditions. It implies quantum fluctuation dissipation relations of any order to be valid. Yeah? And so if we have now, we can hit this symmetry on your Keldish action for the Markov master equation that I was pointing, you find it's violated explicitly. And this, this is how this microscopic quick driving, yeah, time dependent Hamiltonian, you can't define an energy if you think about it. Then um, uh, this, this translates into the absence of the symmetry at low energies where this master equation is valid. Yeah? Yes? It certainly seems clear that opening the system up so that you don't have energy conservation yeah. can certainly lead to uh, a situation that's not equilibrium, but it doesn't necessarily because obviously uh, um, if you're in a grand canonical ensemble or canonical ensemble, mm -hmm. essentially you're not uh, conserving energy. Mm -hmm. You're connected to a reservoir, but this isn't a reservoir, this is a, mm -hmm. is a drive. Mm -hmm. so, so that sounds like perhaps mm -hmm. maybe that's part of the, the thing, but then I think, gee, when I do laser cooling, mm -hmm. I'm driving it, but that system yeah. goes to thermal equilibrium. So what makes the difference? What yeah. is it that's, that's characteristic about a system that's driven uh, that leads mm -hmm. to a non-equilibrium? That's maybe, uh, it's very good questions. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, the, maybe we can go through the next slides, yeah, where, where, the, where the really the note, where you, where you can see a clear difference. Okay. And then we can maybe think <laughs> uh, what, what, how this compares, for example, to laser cooling. Yeah? I think you were putting on equilibrium steady state. Steady state, yeah, yeah, but, but then, no, no, no. I mean, I think also you can look at the steady state of, of so to say, these, these processes yeah, and the, the rate. Ra I mean, I, I think it's off. I mean, you, there is, you will also see yeah, that, that this thermal, uh, so to say, state has really a strong attractive feature. Yeah, in, the, in a sense, I will specify, even in the renormalization group flow, you see that these systems tend to equilibrate if you go to long distances, for example. Yeah? So there is some, so maybe an intuitive picture is, yeah, when you have overweighing Hamiltonian dynamics, yeah, you will say, see just small corrections, and uh, maybe you don't care about these small corrections from time to time. Now here I'm for focusing on systems, yeah, these exciton polaritons, it's not a good idea to think of non-equilibrium as a very small perturbation you want to forget about. Uh, maybe this is sort of the angle to look at it. Yeah? I mean, I'm looking at, strong non-equilibrium conditions, yeah? and, and then you'll see it, but in principle, yeah, you, <laughs> yeah, it's a matter of commuting limits, yeah, I think, <laughs> in a sense. So, um, fine. So, I want to use this symmetry as a non-equilibrium detector. Yeah? For example, you see that this uh, action associated to master equation violates it explicitly, and, and that's now most important, it offers a really intuitive geometric interpretation of non-equilibrium conditions. And to see that, let's look at this master equation. Yeah, we have here this Hamiltonian part. We have this dissipative part. This is reflected in action contributions, which are Hamiltonian or Hermitian or dissipative. And I can here plot now all the couplings that span this action. Yeah, I can plot it here in the complex plane. Real part would be reversible dynamics associated to the Hamiltonian. Imaginary parts would be associated to irreversible um, um, incoherent dynamics, yeah, take an example, two-body loss, uh, two-body processes, you can have either have elastic collisions, yeah, this is the real part here, or you can have inelastic processes yeah, somehow here. And this makes now, here we can now clearly see a difference between equilibrium and non-equilibrium systems. As I was saying, the equilibrium dynamics is protected by this additional symmetry yeah, of energy conservation, essentially, and it entails on the level of these couplings that they're all constrained to lie on a single ray in this complex plane. Yeah? It may look like strange fine tuning, but if you think about it, yeah, the gross petersky equation limit is down here, all couplings real. Yeah? 
the, so to say, these famous Halperin-Hohenberg models describing <coughs> classical critical behaviors are entirely here. And the statement of equilibrium dynamics, of Hamiltonian dynamics, is simply that uh, dissipation, and that the reversible and the irreversible dynamics are not independent. Yeah? They are really pinned on one single line. Yeah? Imagine this as being somehow rotated out of this real axis, and I think that's a proper picture. And that's completely different in, in non-equilibrium circumstance. The coherent and the driven dissipative dynamics, they result from completely different dynamical resources. Yeah, you have this pumping explicitly from the outer. It has nothing to do with the Hamiltonian in your system. And that leads to this spread in the complex plane of couplings. And that's a very fruitful picture that will uh, appear over and over again and that will explain a lot of our observations on this non-equilibrium um, dynamics in stationary state. Three colors. I mean, it's just uh, like take three couplings. Yeah, for example, as I said, Two-body collisions, that's the uh, two-body processes. Yeah, it's, 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 it's this red, the, the blue one. Then this could be, so the real part could be the effective mass, yeah, single particle propagation. And then the imaginary part would be diffusion, yeah, something like a gradient square, yeah, and, and so on, yeah, for all kinds of processes you want to imagine. OK, good. Now that brings me to this um, criticality. and. Um, to begin with uh, smoothly, I would like to remind you um, of critical phenomena and universality in an equilibrium problem. Yeah, universality is, uh, in some sense, the art of systematically forgetting about minor details, yeah, meaning that systems that are really as diverse as this Bose condensate or the planar magnet behave even in a quantitative sense identically if you push them to a critical point. Yeah? And, um, this is witnessed experimentally in large systems by the set of critical exponents yeah, characterizing the decay behavior of this first order spatial coherence function here. In particular, at the critical point, you have a divergence of the correlation length, which is universal with this number nu here, and some correction to the dimensional scaling, uh, which is called the anomalous dimension. Now, the physical picture behind this is um, that this universality is induced precisely by this um, divergent correlation lengths. So of course, if you look at this function here at very short distances, you see a clear difference between diverse physical systems. If you go, however, to longer distances, then a lot of loss of memory happens. Yeah? And you see this algebraic scaling, and that's just cut off by the correlation length in the system yeah, that leads to this exponential decay. So why is it not generic to see this behavior? That's because simply this correlation length typically is on the order of magnitude of the microscopic scales. Yeah? And therefore, OK, you can't see this tail. But by definition, yeah, the critical point is pushing out the scale. And this way, you really free this um, scaling behavior. And you can see these exponents. Now, how to describe this is done in terms of the randomization group. Yeah, the basic picture is a coarse graining, and that was somehow this picture that I had in mind here. Yeah, you take the spins, make a majority vote, and you look at the collective spin where it's pointing. Yeah? And in this coarse graining, you lose a lot of memory on the detailed microscopic spin configuration. Yeah? And you're running, so to say, into this so-called Wilson-Fischer fixed point, where I want to point out yeah, and different systems go to the same one. Yeah, the diff crucial difference is only between interacting and strictly non-interacting systems. Yeah, the non-interacting ones, they are characterized by this so-called Gaussian fixed point of the RG, yeah, which is, has um, rational exponents, while interacting systems are not smoothly connected to that limit, and they have these fractional um, critical exponents here. Now, things would be a little boring yeah, if all systems would exactly collapse to the same universal behavior. Yeah? But uh, there is a twist, and that is that memory on symmetries, and that's why I'm emphasizing it so much, yeah, is actually kept. And that is the reason why this Bose condensate and the planar magnet, they share the same symmetries. The phase rotation symmetry of the Bose condensate is essentially the same as the spin rotations in a plane, and that's why they flow to the same O2 universality class, while making contact to trapped ions, uh, which generically just have discrete set two symmetry, they flow into the same universality class as the liquid gas transition in this linear carbon dioxide uh, molecules, which is the easing universality class. Interesting point from my point of view is this simple consideration. Yeah, imagine 80 stable elements 
combine a few of them, we can easily form 10 to the 10 compounds. The systems have 10 to the 23 or 10 to the 6 degrees of freedom, but still there's only a handful of universality classes which are really in nature existing. And so it's a really strong concept, strong loss of memory. Last ingredient is, so to say, making a difference between quantum and classical criticality. You've certainly all seen this generic quantum phase diagram. We have here uh, an, a non-thermal tuning parameter to tune over the quantum phase transition at t equals zero. For example, mod insulator superfluid transition potential versus kinetic energy. And here's an ordered phase, and uh, uh, possibly ordered but phase without symmetry breaking. And all of this critical line here where the order is lost uh, the statistical fluctuation, thermal fluctuations override the quantum fluctuations. And from that you can read off yeah, this fragility of quantum criticality. You actually need a double fine tuning to reach a quantum critical point. You need to be spectrally close to this critical point. That's this axis and statistically close to this point, meaning you have to lower temperature to zero in order to really see quantum critical scaling. So it's a double fine tuning and also this so to say, scaling regime is limited from below by the temperature. No one can ever reach exactly zero temperature, but there's a scaling regime of frequencies above the critical point here, which really shows the quantum critical scaling, and it's just exited whenever um, when you go beyond this Ginzburg scale. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sort of That's exactly the, that's, that's the question I want to see. Yeah? And also, right, that first part, the second part is that quantum at t equals zero yeah. with non-equilibrium also gives. Yeah, that, that's exactly the same question that I'm also asking. Is that really yeah. the, the most yeah. important? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. Right, so, so how do we perform this in practice? Yeah, this transition to compute the critical behavior. We want to go from the micro scale to the macro scale, so our procedure is First use this one-to-one -one mapping from the operatorial formalism into the functional integral, and then in practice we use actually a functional differential equation instead of a functional integral representation called this functional randomization group equation. This can be evaluated in practice, and that's how we do it. Now how it works? Well, as any RG, we just integrate out high momentum modes instead of coarse graining in real space, and what this does, and that's a thing that I would like to keep you in mind, yeah, it induces, so it's a smooth interpolation between the microscopic physics of this problem and the physics including all the fluctuations. Yeah? So integrating out these high momentum modes, we redefine the action at a smaller scale, yeah? and this gives rise to a flow of all the coupling parameters spanning this, this, this action or this problem, yeah? which is called the randomization group flow. We'll see it now at work in, yeah. It's not a control procedure. It, it's, it's a procedure that seems it, to work. It is a procedure that is based on the derivative expansion. Right. And it, uh, so it's definitely beyond this one loop approximation. It's right. in the sense of the background field method uh, taking it to two loop effects. We can discuss how this relates to two loop. We also no, did right. a recently some field well, theoretical. Two loop is not since systematic. So two loop is not controlled either. It, it's just no, a but determiner. That's right. Yeah, but yeah. for example, it's. We did uh, recently, I mean, a two-loop analysis of precisely this problem here with exactly the same phenomenology. But, of course, different exact values for these exponents. Yeah, but I'm looking for the structures of these problems. Yeah, I mean, the, it's not about the ultimate precision in this exponent, or that's maybe the next stage. Okay. Yeah. I'm just saying that, I mean, there's some, but you don't know that the new phenomena does not appear at three loops. It has happened. Well, yeah, yeah sure, loops, I mean. One versus two. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, we can go on and on. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, okay. But I mean, typically, okay. I mean, it's not critical. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. I, I take this point. Could you flip back to the last yes. slide? Mm -hmm. Christian, this is that trick, right? The Euclidean or what he called average mm -hmm. event, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the fact that he uses Euclidean, you know, that mm -hmm. is applicable for the double Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, what I'm, so what I'm, yeah. Is not the, the thing that you want us to actually catch. That is That's here. That's here. Yeah. Well, okay, well, we could talk about the, the details there, 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There will be more mixing. Yeah. And you will be actually mixing many of yeah, yeah. the yeah. Oh, what, what, what Our principle is so essentially if you think of a, f of a complex frequency plane. Right. Yeah? So real parts are these coherent couplings, imaginary parts are damping rates. Yeah? Our ordering principle is essentially distance from zero in this complex plane of frequency. So that systematically eliminates high momentum modes, both dissipative high momentum modes and as it is a reversible yeah, momentum mode. Yeah? This kind of force plane mm -hmm. is actually akin to the equilibrium RG that we're familiar with. No, no, the equilibrium RG organizes the problem in momentum shells. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But and, uh, because, yeah. because this is not sort of a non equilibrium scheme, okay, so there's a caution here. I'm, I'm not saying that it's wrong. Yeah. Okay, so not time dependent. Yeah, yeah, no, this is about stationary states now. Yeah? Exactly. That's true. Yeah? We can discuss about, uh, so we can nicely discuss about uh, interesting, yeah, I mean, dynamical uh, extensions. Yeah? Good. Um, okay, good. So let's track this RG flow now in this complex plane. So in the be beginning, it's really a mess. Yeah? So this is the microscopic master equation dynamics represented by locations of the couplings in this plane. We look at the RG flow in the beginning, it's rather unstructured, but if we go close to a critical point, things become simple again, yeah? and this flow linearizes. So we see here how actually in this linearized flow regime, we can extract the critical exponents, yeah, which are just, so to say, the speed with which these couplings here are running in the complex plane. Yeah? And the first finding for this classical analog, yeah, we take something like this, uh, uh, exciton polariton systems, you see that the imaginary axis is reached. Yeah? So this fixed point action is purely dissipative. So what does this mean physically? First of all, we see a phenomenon of decoherence, yeah, which is described in the asymptotic stages by a universal decoherence exponent, yeah? and that's what we ad identified in, in this work. Moreover, you can see that this line-up situation corresponds actually to an equilibrium situation. So you can see that at asymptotically large distances, indeed the system shows thermal equilibrium conditions. Yeah, it's emergent. And moreover, and that's the point that I would like to uh, point out now, we can see here this clear difference between equilibrium and non-equilibrium universal behavior. Yeah? And it's again encoded in this picture here, equilibrium dynamics, the RG takes us on this ray to the imaginary axis, yeah? while in non-equilibrium conditions, yeah, these vectors here rotate at a little different speed, yeah? and this, so to say, makes up a fine structure of this decoherence exponent which distinguishes equilibrium and non-equilibrium conditions. Yeah? So in that sense, I mean, due to the absence of energy conservation, which is a symmetry of this problem, yeah, where these equilibrium and driven systems show a difference in their universal behavior. The physical reason is simply, as it's visualized here, the independence of coherent and dissipative dynamics in the absence of energy conservation. And the asymptotic thermalization yeah, is, so to say, witnessed by this uh, couplings aligning on the imaginary axis simply. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, dynamical yeah. concept of yeah. criticality. Exactly. So that's not that's not equilibrium, right? That is equilibrium, and it shows up. I mean, I, I didn't want to make this the topic of, of the talk. Uh, I mean, I could say a lot of more uh, structure in this problem, um, but the um, so no, but the, the dynamical exponent, for example, all the exponents, yeah. yeah, except this decoherence exponent, which we identified as, an, as a new one, all they coincide with equilibrium. And that's sort of, say, sort of say the statement that I'm making here in this asymptotic thermalization. So is this a general, but, general statement about one Bernard Harper in dynamical criticality that all the exponents are the same as equilibrium? I mean, is there, is a, there is a kind of, of no, no, as a when, then this is all just this symmetry, a presence or absence of, of, of this specific symmetry I was pointing out. Yeah? So it's, it's fully universal statement, 
and it's just say, saying, okay, we have, I don't have the picture, yeah, but we have a kind of shell structure, yeah, the, the static and the dynamic, so-called dynamical exponent coincide for equilibrium and energy non-conserving systems, but there is another shell, there is a, an additional exponent which really was overlooked previously, and that has this fine structure that, uh, that shows the difference between equilibrium and non-equilibrium. in the old work you're saying it was all the same as equilibrium? In, in, uh, in the some, so yeah, these, they, yeah, they didn't look at this, uh, at this exponent because they, so do they started on this axis, they just followed the RG flu on the axis here, if you want. And so we looked at, so to say, how is it approached? And that, so they couldn't see that exponent. James, yeah. on this point, I'm with Sebastian. Yeah. But let me ask you this. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, I saw at the, yeah, this, I mean, you can see the scale where the universe, so like a Ginzburg scale and all of so that, yeah. Yeah. At yeah, this yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Solving this so equation. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like, the, the last line on that slide, it sounds like you're saying that whether it's on the left or on the right, which are different uh, symmetry classes, yes. Yes. I, I like that, that classification. Yeah. But it sounds like what you're saying is in the long run, everything is thermal. Is that what you're saying? I mean, it's, there is certainly, I mean, okay, then I should have spent more time, yeah, but there is a feature of this behavior, yeah, where if you look at specific observables, like the two-time temporal correlation function, you couldn't distinguish equilibrium from non-equilibrium. Mm -hmm. But if you focus on another observable, on the dynamical susceptibility, okay. you can see the difference. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's a, so you have to, some observable coincide, and that's also a result, yeah, but others don't. Okay, let me now move to an analogy of quantum critical behavior. So let's think of a situation where we just um, copy what we had before and take this to a specific limit. We take the single particle pump, the many body elastic scattering problem here, and uh, two and single, two, uh, two and two, one and two particle losses. But we add now the, a strong quantum diffusion term. So what do we mean with this, or where could it come from? If you think of this micro cavity arrays, yeah, you can, so to say, think of coupling these um, microwave uh, cavities here with opposite Rabi frequency to, the say, superconducting qubit here. You get such a term here, and if you operate the system in a regime where this superconducting qubit is rapidly decaying, yeah, then you see that this gradient operator actually moves into this Lindblad equation in, in precisely this form here. Now, what is the physical interpretation of such a quantum diffusion term? Now, um, one could look at this as a certain kind of dark state yeah, in, for a number conserving variant. Uh, there, there's actually previous work on that. Yeah? And you can see that if you go to Fourier space, simply, yeah, you see then a decay rate which has this noiseless spot here down there at Q equals zero, and else you have this quadratically dispersing or quadratically going with momentum um, um, decay rate. Yeah? And so this dynamics is at least compatible yeah, with a population of uh, a Bose condensate at this momentum Q equals zero, yeah, while all other states are really damping out. Yeah? So this favors or um, the accumulation of bosons in the Q equals zero state. Of course, you can think then, okay, if I look at such a system and I put some interaction on top of it, I would expect this leads to dephasing and at some point to a phase transition. Yeah? So that's now basic picture, looking at a system in 1D. And now I want to come to the point, so what does this situation actually have to do with this quantum uh, problem, with quantum critical behavior? And the analogy can be revealed by looking at the noise level that one has in an equilibrium system. Yeah? If, if you look at an equilibrium system, yeah, say the system, to make it simple, which is coupled to a bath, both are at the same temperature in global equilibrium, we integrate out the bath, then we get a noise level for this system, for the remaining system, which is this function here. This is two times the Bose distribution plus one. And um, you can see here two regimes. There's one regime at frequencies well below this temperature scale, so around the origin here, 
where we may approximate this as a flat um, noise level. So this leads then the flat noise level leads to delta correlations in uh, classical Markovian noise, and that's what finite temperature is. But if we look at frequencies much above the temperature scale or just send temperature to zero, then we see here this mod omega coming out, and you see here highly non-Markovian noise correlations, as you were pointing out, yeah, that are so characteristic of this zero temperature true quantum problem. Yeah? And again, in a quantum problem, it's not the absence of any noise. There is one noiseless spot down here, but else, I mean, as a function of frequency, of course, the system is noisy, and that's just these quantum uh, fluctuations. So characteristic is here a scaling of the noise level, and that we also have now with our, so to say, Markovian noise, yeah, with our dark state. We see here there's also a scaling of the momentum of, of the noise level, as I was pointing out. It is going quadratically with momentum. Well, it's scaling, and if the dynamic exponent, yeah, if omega scales like q square, it's actually the same scaling that we have here in equilibrium. The big difference is that this is a scaling as a function of momentum. For each momentum mode, we are entirely Markovian. And here, it is a non-Markovian frequency dependent scaling with momentum. So there is now a clear difference between this equilibrium and non-equilibrium situ situation. So let's look where this leads. Okay, there's now limitations to this, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, that's exactly, I'm looking for this analogy, yeah. Here we are looking Markovian for any of these bins, yeah, for any of these modes. It's flat in frequency, right? And here it's flat in momentum, yeah, but resolved as a function of frequency. And that makes this non-Markovian, yeah, if I Fourier transform mod omega, I get this, get this yeah, non-Markovian. Yeah. No, no, I, I mean, I, I, I'm saying this is a Markovian system, but it shares, I mean, I'm constructing an analogy. Not everything is identical. Yeah? An analogy, it, the analogy is scaling with momentum of the noise level. And that gives rise to something that has exactly the same canonical scaling of a quantum critical point. Still, of course, I'm most interested in what's different. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we found um, um, a new fixed point, yeah, which is less stable than the one I was discussing previously. And this nicely fits with the expectation yeah, that just as in a quantum critical point, we have two fine tunings, yeah, two directions we have to fine tune in order to reach this critical point. Yeah, that's nicely reflected in this analysis, two repulsive directions. And this is a set of numbers. Don't look at the details. Just comparing this and the second line tells you something number-wise important. Namely, there is no quantum classical correspondence, uh, which should be reflected in the static critical exponents here in these two rows for a classical and a quantum problem. Being, uh, be, it, would, it should be possible to link them to each other, and the numbers should be the same. That's not happening. So it's already an indication of a really new non-equilibrium universality class. And let me characterize this universality class in more detail. Yeah, so we can even really directly see different physics at work. Yeah? First of all, there is no asymptotic decoherence in this problem going on. Yeah? It leads to some details here, okay. But you, pictorially, it's this, this situation. Yeah? We can, again, plot all the couplings in this complex plane, but we don't see now this moving, this RG moving of all these scales towards the imaginary axis. Yeah? And that's strictly different yeah, in this quantum analog problem to the classical driven problem where all these couplings would align on the imaginary axis. And it is also structurally different really from a T equals zero equilibrium problem where all these, where the fixed point would be entirely aligned on the real axis. Yeah, with subleading dissipative corrections. And um, so this is somehow an interesting instance yeah, where these couplings freeze in the complex plane, giving rise to this mixed fixed point with finite dissipative and coherent couplings at the same time. Moreover, we can see that this problem doesn't show this behavior of asymptotic thermalization. So even at very large wavelengths, it keeps this non-equilibrium characteristics that is, so to say, can be done, this analysis, on the basis of the symmetry I was pointing out. And pictorially, again, you can see as a necessary condition, yeah, if we would see something like equilibrium, these 
guys should at least move towards some common axis here, they don't do it, and that's really structurally different from, from the classical problem. Yeah? Formally, this is reflected in this uh, set of critical exponents, and something interesting happens here on top. It is not possible to choose this so-called complex, uh, so this wave function randomization factor here as a real number, and it would show some uh, limiting cycle behavior um, with, however, a huge, a huge period. So um, the uh, observable uh, consequences of this driven criticality, I, I just list where these exponents occur here, and the static exponents, for example, they are again encoded in this first order spatial coherence function. Yeah, the dynamical exponents yeah, would require to probe the dynamical single particle renormalized response function here. So uh, you see all these, these guys appearing here. But I have to be, or I want to, to point this out, yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing this now as, so to say, something that is, is done tomorrow, say, with microcavity arrays, because, I mean, you really require, so to say, scaling over decades. I see this rather, so to say, at that stage as something that is really fascinating to, to f nail down the differences between equilibrium and non-equilibrium, and I hope that in the longer run, I mean, people will go to larger systems and being able to at some point see this physics. Okay, I have five minutes, <laughs> or not even, four. so the, if it's four minutes, and um, we, I, I would also be, be open to, <laughs> to dropping this, <laughs> to saying this in, yeah, or maybe just, uh, should I just flash it, or, or I can comment on this phase diagram here, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this phase di diagram shows you on this axis a, a well-known classical problem, a classical non-equilibrium phase transition, known as the as sort of the directed percolation universality class, yeah, which is somehow uh, just just to put it here, it's it's the universality class of this contact process here, just uh, spins or active or inactive sites on a lattice. Yeah, where the, the, dense, the order parameter is the density of active sites and you have local dynamical rules yeah, where, so to say, an active site can be mapped into, can decay to an inactive site and an, uh, and an active site can do an offspring or a branching by infecting, if you want, it's also a model of infection, yeah, a neighboring site. Yeah? While what is not possible to have an offspring from the vacuum, yeah, so to go from an inactive to an active site. You need, really need this infection from the site. Yeah? So immediately, this also shows you intuitively that this is a problem without detailed balance, yeah? because you can decay, but you cannot, so to say, emerge from the vacuum. And in classical problem, there's really no fluctuation, so there cannot be a detailed balance. And there's also a unique absorbing state, yeah? which you have, so to say, when everything is empty. And this phase transition, can actually be implemented with, um, with um, Rydberg atoms. And uh, so to say, this is a work by, by the group of Igor Lezanovsky on this axis here. And what we recently um, figured <laughs> is that um, we can formulate a, a quantum version of this process. So this is the quantum analog of this offspring process, of this branching process. And it leads actually to this um, additional axis in the phase diagram. And on this axis, you get a, a very different uh, phenomenology of the, of the phase transition. Uh, the phase transition of, is of first order, and moreover, one can see that this, that asymmetry, again, is broken. That is characteristic of this classical directed percolation problem down here. It is broken upon, on this line, and in particular, gives rise here again to another non-equilibrium non uh, universality class yeah, which, uh, which one could see at this point here. Now let me summarize. Um, yeah, that uh, <laughs> uh, was a lot of stuff that I, I skipped, but I enjoyed the really uh, nice, lively discussion. The point I want to make in the end yeah, is that I really believe that these driven open many body systems provide an arena for, for doing non-equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics yeah, because they microscopically have this quantum origin, it doesn't guarantee that quantum, so to say, in senses I was specifying, persists to, to large distances, but it has a chance to do so. Yeah? And um, I think there's really a lot of interesting directions, yeah, in part, uh, which are 
I have followed here, for example, this open system quantum Hall effect. So here I would ask the question, what is specifically non-equilibrium about these systems? Yeah. There's also experiments in the Imamoglu group yeah, that look at driven open fermion ensembles. Yeah, fermion is another so the degree of freedom that you don't have in the classical world of statistical mechanics. And there's a lot of, so to say, theory uh, development to be done uh, to really understand all the universal low frequency dynamics that can go on in the system. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>